Hi everyone, welcome to the first ever episode of I Like Networking.、Uh, I like to apologize for the weird sound at the beginning of the episode because we were still figuring out the best way to use the microphone. But it's a very, very good conversation, so stick with us. Here with Isabella Coraza, an independent dress historian, lecturer, and curator based in London. So, Isa, hello. How are you doing today? Yes, I'm very well. I'm very excited to be here. Yay! So, Isa, to kick things up, kick it up, off, kick it off, kick it off, kick it off. Yeah. Oops. Two Brazilians together. That's gonna be great. <laughs> that's gonna be to, exciting. To kick things off with some grammatical mistakes,、uh, tell us what is the worst job you ever had? Oh goodness. Okay,、um, I've been very lucky that I've had really amazing jobs throughout my life. But there was one that sounded really, really exciting at start.、Um, it was this exhibition, an independent exhibition here. In London, it was during the World Cup that was hosted by South Africa.、I、cannot remember the year,、um, but anyways, it was like this independent exhibition with、um, the works from a photographer. I think she was from Belgium, but it could have been Netherlands.、Um, but she had traveled across the African continent, so throughout different、um, countries and different places, and she had photographed. How local people engaged with football, and it was really, really beautiful. The images were amazing, but、um, the exhibition was hosted、um, in a very small gallery in a residential area in London. So, and I was there like for the whole month, and super excited. It was like, yeah, we're gonna sell those photographs, and people will be beautifully enlightened by. Football in Africa and how the sport can bring people together. You know, you had all this like lots of mission、um, about it, and it, it was, yeah, we were all very、um, positive about it. And the whole month, nobody came. <laughs> it was so boring. I mean, I the first day was exciting. I was like, no, it's okay. It's a slow start. You know, I'm around those beautiful images. And then the second day was like, okay, okay, we'll pick it up. And then by the end, I was like reading "Vile Bodies" from Evelyn Vaughn, which is also a very boring book. It was just a very <laughs> boring experience. Yeah, that sounds pretty dreadful. I actually worked for an art gallery as well when I was beginning my career, and the exhibitions were so dead, especially during the week.、Yeah. And I read a lot as well. <laughs> It was just so boring. I know.、Oh, I know. I mean.、God. You ha- you have to put a lot of. I mean, I appreciate people that work, you know, in shops and in galleries much more. And sometimes when I pass by now and I see a shop that is empty and you just see the person inside like doing nothing, I'm like, you know what? I feel for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. You 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 learn some more empathy. That's always good. It's yeah. It's it's really brilliant. <laughs> Oh my God! So Isa, you've worked for basically every museum in London, I think. Well, not every, but many. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of a museum rat. I would like to think so. Yeah. Yeah, but so, but you started your career studying fashion in Brazil. So can you just give us a bit insight on how you ended up working in museums in London? Yeah, sure. So yes,、yeah, so、I'm from São Paulo and. Back then, I thought I was—I wanted to be a fashion designer. I'm a very creative person, and you know, I love fashion. And I thought, yeah, fashion design will be amazing. I'm gonna be this, you know, very exciting designer, and the world will be beautiful.、Um, and then I studied、um, fashion design at Santa Marcelina, and it was great. I mean, it was a Fabulous course, really, really good. I was exposed to everything. So that course, you don't just specialize on a particular subject until your final collection. So you have to do like accessories, jewelry,、um, you know, menswear, womenswear. You have to do everything, which is amazing because it gives you such a round view of fashion. But it was uber intense.、Um, at times, it felt like torture. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, it, it's yeah, it's very intense. And I remember like not it was four what four months that I didn't sleep. And I was very creative, but also very anxious. And and one thing that I noticed is that although I'm creative, I'm more academic, and yeah. I have a big brain. Um, and <laughs> modest. I, I, have, I have a big brain and small hands, which yeah. meant I thought a lot, but met, then didn't had mo- enough time to do the things. Um, so I was suffering a lot with that. And I always loved history. When I was growing up, I wanted to be an archaeologist. And, you know, like I wanted to to go into digs and excavations and loved history. But at the end, I went to fashion because fashion was way more glamorous. Um, and and I, I liked it. But I realized that I hated the fashion industry, how it worked. It was all about, you know, production, 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 sell, sell, sell. You have to create this many trousers and these many dresses. And no, you yeah. cannot have prints with embroidery, with lace, with handmade, whatever, because it's too expensive and people won't work, won't buy it. I was also very fortunate to work with Emanuele Junqueira at, yeah. um, in Brazil, who's a, a big... A Brazilian designer, wonderful, wonderful designer, and um, her aesthetic is very similar than mine, which meant we would spend like you know we would think of all these amazing ways to create a dress with lace, and the lace will be hand embroidered, and we're gonna dye it afterwards, and the processes were beautiful, but holy crap, they were expensive, and you know <laughs> <laughs> that's not how the fashion industry works. So I started to get a little bit, not disappointed, but disillusioned with the whole kind of, this is a capitalist uh, business at the end of the day. Um, And and I I wanted to do things inspired by 18th century, how Belafon says, I mean, who the fuck wants, oh, sorry, who the F wants a a black... It's okay, you can curse, you can curse. It's adult conversation. Good, okay, so... Who wants to, you know, wear something inspired by Hobbel Lachlan says? Most people don't even know what the heck am I talking about. So all that to say, my final year at uh, at, um, Santa Marcelina, I found this course at Central St. Martin's that was all about fashion history. It was like all of a sudden, I remember finding about this course in the middle of an ethics um, lecture. (laughs) (laughs) This is how much I was paying attention. I was just going through portfolios of courses in at Central St. Martin's, and then I found fashion history, and all of a sudden I realized, holy shit, I can actually do that for a profession. You know, I can be a historian in fashion and earn some money. And and my father used to tell me when I was wanted to be a, an archaeologist, he was like, so what are you going to do with this? You can either work for a museum or a university. Well, surprise, yeah. surprise, I now work for universities and museums. Yeah, exactly. Um, you just okay. go around things. Before at Santa Marcelina, you didn't study fashion history? Was that not a thing? Oh, no, you did. So we had um, three years of fashion history, which is more than design students here, say, at Santa St. Martins. They don't get that much exposure to fashion history. But at Santa Marcelina, we were exposed to it, and I loved it. It was my favorite um, my favorite module, and in fact, I l- adored my my tutor then, Miti, so much that I would go for dinners with her. <laughs> I just loved it. I love hanging out with her PhD students and friends, and I, it was just like a, a much more comfortable environment. But I never in Brazil, I didn't realize you can be a fashion historian. I thought fashion history was just something that helps you be more creative or if I have a better way of designing. I didn't realize it was a profession on its own. I mean, the clue that Nietzsche was doing it, I don't think <laughs> um, it fits in my brain. So yeah. although I had, and I loved it, but I just didn't think it was a viable uh, profession until I realized you can study it and be become a fashion uh, historian and have that on a piece of paper saying that's what you do. Um, and, and it also brought me to London, which is, you know, it was a place that I always wanted to be. And it, it took me to Central St. Martins. And of course, now I, I work there. So, 
yeah, but this is how it all started, really. Yeah. So I get, but I think this is important considering the topic of uh, our podcast, which is you evolve. You, I know you, so I know that throughout your career, you've worked with a lot of people you liked, mm -hmm. and you are very good, I think, in building relationships, right? Um, Especially with people much, much, much senior than me. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. So how, for instance, did you end up going for you know dinner with Miti? And how do you? Is this something that happens naturally, or do you ask? How do you start those conversations? Um, I'm. I have a very old soul. I like. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very old woman inside a relatively young body. Uh, yeah. So I and I mean I I always gravitated towards uh, people that were older than me, but also more knowledgeable than me. They were above me. I always gravitated, and I think with Nietzsche, I don't even remember how it started. I think we we always had like chats after class of just before class, and I think I was unfortunately one of the only students that absolutely loved that module and took it very seriously. Everybody else thought it was, oh it's just another thing we had to do. Um, so I think there was already that kind of meeting of interest. She could see I was very passionate about it and we would have conversations on the side. And I think um, every time there was an exhibition in Brazil, she would tell the group, oh, you should go see this or you should go see that. And, and I think one day we bumped into each other in one exhibition and she was like, oh, do you want to grab a coffee afterwards? And I was like, oh, my God, yes. And, and then... The <laughs> And then the coffee became like, oh, I'm actually meeting some of my PhD friends. Do you want to join us? And yes. And then, you know, before I knew it, I was joining their Christmas parties. And <laughs> <laughs> But that's good. So you say yes to things. That, I think that's really important. I yes. always say that to people that the no is always a given. You need to put yourself out there and usually say yes for things, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I just... Go with the flow. If an opportunity appears, you know, you bump into somebody, just make the most out of it. You know, what, life is so full of um, unplanned meetings and, and crossing paths. So ju just go with it. You know, if, if you meet somebody and you have something in common, go for a coffee, you know. Just yeah. just make it happen and, and build a relationship. And I, I, I so believe in relationships, um, working relationships, and this kind of idea that, you know, if you have something in common, make, make that be the starting point so you can flourish into something else. Yeah, that's really nice. Well put, Lisa. Ah, thank you. So wait, so then you ended up coming to London to study... Yes. So I did another degree. Then I finished my very hard, um, hardworking fashion design degree. And so in Brazil, the academic year goes from February to December. So you end um, your academic year in December with the kind of calendar year. And in London or in Europe, the academic year starts in September and goes until June. So basically, I finish my course in December and I immediately started this fashion history and theory course at Central St. Martins um, and it already had started. So I already missed the first term, but because I had already had three years of fashion history, um, people at St. Martins said, it's okay, you're just going to miss kind of the first term is usually an introduction and you already had that. Um, so I graduated and a week later I moved to London and already started a new course. Oh my God. Have, have you been to London before? Uh, no. And you didn't know anyone here, I assume? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> and it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant because it meant that I was available to meeting people and because not many Brazilians study fashion history. Um, the course was mostly British students, a couple of American, but mostly British students. I ended up integrating into, you know, British culture immediately because those are, were the people that I was engaging with. That is really nice. It was really nice. It, it was. And I mean, I know there's a Brazilian mafia here in London, <laughs> <laughs> but it took me a long time to meet them. It was, I think, when you moved that I started yeah. to be more introduced to other Brazilians. 
Yeah, because I'm the head of the mafia. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no mafia here, guys. No, no, no. It's not a mafia in the kind of business sense, but in the sense that, you know, Brazilians gravitate toward each other. And oh, yeah. and yeah, if you know one, you know a hundred. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. We go around in packs. <laughs> But wait, while while you were at Santa Marta, is that when you started working for museums? Yes, or no, was that yeah, after? Yeah. No, no, no. It was first year. Um, we had a couple of classes with Beatrice Berlin, who's the senior curator at the Museum of London. And this was already in the first year. We we're having classes with her, and I'm thinking, I want to work in a museum. So I already moved knowing that eventually I wanted to be in a museum. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's my archaeology frustrated dream. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I, I moved already knowing, you know, I want to be a historian and I want to work in a museum. So we had those classes with Beatrice and that was a great thing about my course at Sessions and Martins. You were exposed to so many exciting professionals and it's just a matter of like, well, they're already doing it. Just approach them. So, you know, after a class, I just came to her and I was shaking, you know, with very <laughs> heavy accent. I was like, hi, Beatrice. Um, you know, um, right. Um, hi, Beatrice. <laughs> you know, it was a little bit like that. And she was like, yeah. And I'm like, well, I, I'm really interested in working in a museum. Do you think there's an opportunity at um, Museum of London for internship? And it just so happens that Beatrice is the most supportive person for young, you know, s students and young people I've ever met. And I now joke that she is my career's godmother. Um, but she was like, well, just send me your CV and come and see if you like, because most people tend to think working in museums is pretty glam and actually it's not. So come, you know, for a day and see if you like. And so I did, I, I remember it was in September. Um, and I just came for one day and I fell in love. We, we did something, I think really boring. I think I was just kind of repacking some Tyvek bags or whatever it was helping to organize this and I was like this is so amazing like I was so in love and and I stayed with Beatrice for volunteering at the Museum of London for five years oh and, my god and we have like this beautiful friendship now and you know we go for coffees from time to time and she also she continues to teach at St. Jose Martin so every time we meet there it's always like I don't know meeting an old friend and you know we're always chatting about it and and she helps me so much so then when I um decided to take a placement here so first of all she was the one who taught me everything about collections management so if Beatrice ever listens to this podcast um thank you everything that I learned about collections management came from you and what I was doing at the Museum of London and because we I was there for so long the relationship developed that it got to a point that she would be like what do you want to do today you know it was more based on like what I wanted to be exposed to and I love organizing and my dream was always like whenever we had a free time I would just organize the store um repack things and and that worked really well so then when um during Central St. Martin's my course um you have the option of taking a whole year just to do internships so you don't have classes you just work wow. And for a whole is, year? For a whole year. So this is nice. called a placement year. So instead of doing your course in three years, you're doing four. And the third year is where you get exposure to the industry. And this is very good, especially for design students, because this is when they go and, you know, work for all those brands. And then afterwards they have a relationship. Anyways, so I decided to take a placement year. And Beatrice was the one who went through my application um, for the V&A. And then when I applied for my scholarship at Historic Royal Palaces, Beatrice was the one who read through my um, application. So it's nice to create those bonds because, as I said, she is my career's godmother. <laughs> that's amazing. But you also asked for it. So that's really good. Oh, yes. I mean, always. If you don't ask, you don't get it. You know, yeah. like people, most people, they want to help you, but they don't know you need help until you ask for it. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> it is true. It is true. 
So then what was your first like paying job in London? Uh, at the V&A. So at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So when I did my placement there, it was a very, I mean, luck or, you know, the universe, call it whatever you want. But the same year that I took placement was the year that the cloth workers, so all their dress collection was moving from the v to a whole new purpose-built um, facility. And it was a... Well, the project, the planning started five years earlier, but the action of it started exactly when my placement started. So I did that. I spent a whole year helping, working for this cloth workers project at the Victor and Albert Museum. And I got to basically see 90% of the collection. I moved 88,000 objects, like some of the most precious objects of the v oh you know, I, I got to work with them. And I worked with all the curators in the department because that's also something that you don't usually do. But because of the nature of the project, all curators were involved. So I worked with all the curators, which was amazing. But then my placement ended you know, and it was time for me to go back to uni and finish my degree. But the project itself had not ended. There was still another year. So the VNA were like, well, we, we're willing to offer you a contract. So you finish, you stay here until we finished with the, the project. You see it because you saw from day one, it would be nice if you see it from the last day. And obviously I was doing something right. Um, and so I went back to St. Joseph and Mars and I was like, yeah, by the way, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, 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 you have to come back. You have to finish, but we can give you another gap year. So I took a second gap year. It wasn't now called placement. It was called gap year. And I worked. So this, my second year at the v was paid as a, as staff, basically. Wow. That's amazing. That was amazing. That was, I mean such an amazing opportunity and I learned so much um, of course it was hard work and at the end I was ready to see that project end <laughs> yeah but no it was amazing and that was my first paid job here I think it's important to just metify that because I also had a placement at the Victorian Albert Museum as you know because um, you told me about it yes. so but I think people usually think if they haven't been in the industry too long, that being a curator or being in the curatorial department, it's super glam and you do a lot of research. But when you're starting <laughs> out, you're doing a lot of manual tasks, right? Oh, but even like senior people, like when I was doing um, this cloth worker project, I mean, I was working with people like Oreo Cullen and, you know, Susan North, and they are huge, like very established senior curators. They do huge exhibitions. I mean, Oreo curated the Dior exhibition. You know, it's, it's really high up. And we were both like in jeans, kneeling on the floor, weighing carpets. It's, it's what you do. I mean, a curatorial position it might be glamorous elsewhere, uh, but not in London. I mean, in London, curators, they work hard and you do a lot of research, but you do a lot of other things. And sometimes, many times, manual labor is part of that. Yeah, and I think it's good because you know a lot about how to take care of clothes. So if anyone ever needs <laughs> what to do, you know, Isa is the one who told me that clothes don't need to breathe. You can put them in a plastic bag and they'll survive. Oh, right. it's better for them because yeah. then they're not exposed to humidity and, you know, bugs and light. Yes, exactly. If you ever need somebody to tell you, I mean, my dream is to go to people's wardrobes and say, let's organize this shit. Um, <laughs> this is like my dream thing. I love doing that. So if you ever need somebody <laughs> to tell you you're not, you know, doing your clothes the best job i'm the person yeah you can come to mine oh yes anytime thank you honestly i'll pay with pão de queijo oh doubt for anyone who doesn't know a pão de queijo is the brazilian cheese bread thing it's incredible uh so yeah uh isa that's really good so when did your like big passion for working with like archives and collections and conservation as well came was it right away at the Museum of London or did yeah. the VNA help? No, um, no, no. It was Museum of London. It was 
like day one at the Museum of London, I realized I love objects. In fact, I like being with objects more than I like being with people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just love objects so much. And you, they become children. It's like they're my children. I have responsibility over them. So, you know, you become very attached. I mean, the first time I put, um, I redid the storage for some shoes, I cried. You know, it was beautiful. <laughs> they were so much happier. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I, I do. I, you know, it's, it's fun working with exhibitions. People tend to think like the most glamorous thing about duration is, is doing exhibitions. And yeah, they're fun, but they're a lot of hard work. And I never worked for an exhibition where something didn't go wrong halfway through. Um, and you were like, is this ever going to happen? You know, it's, it's a lot of stress. And of course, the, when you open, is really exciting. And, you know, seeing people enjoying it is really lovely. But for me, the really beautiful, fulfilling part is being with objects and make them visible. So, you know, doing, um, showing students... Uh, to the store and showing objects and talking about objects and, you know, um, researching them. That is what I love the most. Aww. So what was the biggest disaster in an exhibition? I didn't know they were so prone to disasters. Oh, there's always something. Like, you know, most museums are historic buildings, so there are a lot of limitations. So you have this wonderful idea of having, I don't know, a projection somewhere and then they come to you and say, okay, so where's the power plug? And you're like, oh, yeah, there's none. Um, you know, and or like you realize that the object that you wanted, you're going to need a loan, but the museum that owns it already promised that to somebody else. Or, you know, the object that it was the main purpose of that particular thing, that in the exhibition, it's really bad con um condition and the conservatives said yeah no way you're having that on display so all those kind of really difficult challenges it's not just like i have this idea put a bunch of things together boom it's ready you know you have to think of like conservation and and logistics and money money is so boring you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know um, And like oh, very expensive and you're a brilliant idea. You realize you cannot. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's wonderful when it happens, but there are a lot of things in the middle that you have to figure. It's not just having a great idea and it's done. You know, there's all the kind of practical logistical things that tend to go wrong. And it probably will at one point. You just <laughs> yeah. have to adapt, I suppose. So wait, so you worked at the V&A, then you went back to St. Martin's, and then at some point, one, you got a job at the Historic Royal Palaces, and two, you also went back to university because, <laughs> God, you love studying. I do love studying. So yeah, so I, I finished my experience at the V&A. You know, class work is open. It's a massive success. You know, it's wonderful. But I realized that all the jobs like assistant curator and even curator afterwards, if you didn't have a master's, you weren't even considered. It wasn't necessarily about the experience. I had a ton of experience by that point, you know, four years at the uh, Museum of London, two years at the V&A. I mean, I had a lot of experience and the knowledge of fashion history because, I, you know, I was finishing my, my second degree and, and yet, I wouldn't even go through the first phase of application. So you usually museums, because they're um, government um, funded institutions, you, it, the application process is quite painful. It's not just sending a CV. You have to do a form online and write and blah, blah, blah. And I wouldn't even go past the first phase because I didn't have masters. And I always thought that was such idiot, you know, like, such a waste of time so um i when i finished my degree at central st martin's i immediately applied for masters in museum studies so, just so i could have a piece of paper in order to to be able to successfully apply for very bottom jobs you know assistant curator 
just so happened that my museum studies course was brilliant. I did learn quite a lot. It wasn't just getting a piece of paper. And um, so I, I did that at UCL, University College London. And one of their scholarship schemes was in partnership with Historic Royal Palaces. And for those of you that don't know Historic Royal Palaces, it's an independent charity that look after six um, palaces across the UK. So they have five in London um, and one in Northern Ireland. Um, and Historic Royal Palaces, they provided this um, scholarship. So they paid for my master's. Um, master's was one year, but I would have to do it part-time. So I did it in two years. And so they would pay for my master's. I would work for them, get the experience, and they would also pay a salary, which is incredibly rare in museums in this country. Usually internships are unpaid. Um, they're called volunteering, not necessarily internship. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is incredibly problematic because it means the only people that get the experience are the ones that can afford to not be paid. And this is so, you know, it's a big problem in the industry. I mean, it's a huge problem in the industry. But yeah. I was very fortunate that I had the, the like enough support from um you know, I had I, I worked through the summers and I saved money and all that. And from the VNA, I, I was earning, so I managed to save a little. But um, masters are expensive. You know, education is expensive, and then not working for free can be quite hard. So um, I got that scholarship from Historic Royal Palaces, which was like the best thing that could happen. So they pay for my masters, my tuition. They gave me a salary so I could pay my bills and eat. Um, and then I also got to work. So I was based at Kensington Palace um, and I was working under the curator Deirdre Murphy, who sadly is no longer with us. But Deirdre became my mentor. She she was God so brilliant. Um, and, you know, she was amazing. And then I did my master's and I finished and Star Wars Palaces were like, well, there you go. Here's a contract. Stay with us. And I kept going from contract to contract to contract to contract until a month ago or two months ago. <laughs> so, yeah, I stayed there throughout. Oh, that's nice. So why did Deirdre become such a powerful presence in your life? I mean, what was she teaching you? Or uh, Deirdre, she was one of those incredible people that she, she had a, an instinct for mentoring and she was she was Canadian, and and she had that kind of American um, business mind that sometimes is difficult to find here in in Europe with people working in the arts. I mean, not everybody; many people are business minded, but in museums, usually curators are you know the stereotypical um, research led, live on their own little world. Usually, it's the 18th century or before that. Um, but they're not necessarily business savvy, and, and Deirdre was really, really. So she would tell me things like, "Stop apologizing," you know, like show who you, your skills. And and she was very supportive. Always gave projects to me that she knew would complement my experience, and and she introduced me to a lot of different people. And she was very exciting. You know, she had lots of fabulous friends. Um, she was very knowledgeable but it was that sense of yes I know you know now how to do exhibitions or how to deal with objects you had I had that already but I wasn't very good in say maybe selling an idea or um, promoting myself or asking for a raise I mean I'm still so scared terrified of negotiating um, contracts and stuff but she was the one who pushed me in that sense she was like, okay, you're in the arts now. You have to, you know, move your butt a little bit and make things happen. Um, so, and other than that, she was super fun and, and fabulous and glamorous and knowledgeable and all around an amazing person. That's so nice. And I would say that unless you're like a doctor or, you know, someone who needs to know how to build a bridge, mm -hmm. those sort of soft skills are mm -hmm. almost more important than anything else, right? I agree. I agree because the experience, you get it. You know, you like the qualification, anybody can 
enroll and get a piece of well not everybody i mean i know many many people unfortunately don't have this opportunity but the chances are many people it will be easier for them to get a qualification that it will be to create you know a, a, a network or you know you can work in your work experience you can learn how to i don't know write reports or how to in my case make sure clothes are safely stored i mean you learn that it's fine but it's it's the soft skills you know this kind of relationship and negotiating those are much more difficult to learn and usually if you have somebody that can be there with you it makes the process better i think yeah for sure having support really helps <laughs> yeah and like somebody that it's already ballsy to start with and you know already knows how to to get what they need usually it's a good place to start because they will tell you how to do it i mean i was always so apologetic about everything i would start every single email with like oh i'm really sorry for this late reply or you know oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm sorry i haven't sent you this yet and it would be like stop apologizing what do you have to apologize for you're busy you couldn't write this email now they wait suck it you know like <laughs> <laughs> like you're busy don't apologize Or, or she would be like, I, w I was always dealing with other departments. I was always very accommodating to other people's needs. So if we were doing something with the conservatives, I would change my whole diary so we could do it on the best possible time for them. And she would be like, yeah, it's good to be accommodating, but what about your needs? Like, they need to accommodate to yours too. So, you know, sometimes you need somebody to tell you how to be a little bit mean or a little bit more, not mean, but a little bit more... Um, You know assertive assertive yes thank yeah, you yeah you're welcome <laughs> yeah that sounds great so do you think she was like the best boss you've ever had i had really good bosses in different ways but oh my god i loved her so much yeah that's good that's a nice experience to have oh better yeah. than telling everyone about the terrible bosses you've had i i'm lucky i've only had really nice bosses but then again i I like people that are more knowledgeable than me. I don't feel threatened by it. I, I feel like I learn more. You know, some people are very competitive and yeah. they and they feel like, oh, I, I need to become you in the less possible time and I need to get your job in. And I'm like, no, I mean, they, they know more than me. They have more experience than me. I'll, I'll wait. Or not wait, but I'll, I'll learn from you. And when the time comes, I'll succeed as well. But I yeah. find that many people are too ambitious and sometimes that like interferes a little bit with building relationships and, and being able to learn from other people. Yeah. But did you have the same experience with coworkers in that you've always had supportive teams or was it not the same? Not the same. Really? Um, I, I mean, I had brilliant coworkers and we're personally, we're friends. Um, but I think because museums can be so competitive, so so competitive there's so little jobs and even less permanent jobs everybody's fighting for the next contract i think it can create a little bit of a, a competitive environment um and and i feel my relationship with say my managers or people that were much above me because i wasn't a threat um it was a much more comfortable sometimes with colleagues because we're all fighting for the same positions um, and competing for the, the same, you know, position and the same opportunities, it can sometimes lead to a little bit of um, competitiveness that in my mind, or for me personally, it's not fruitful. I mean, I, I, I thrive in sharing. Some people thrive in taking it, I suppose. Um, and I have come across that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it's not something you usually picture when you're talking about curators, right? But it is very competitive to get a spot. And as you said, the, you know, maybe this is just something in the museum scene in the UK, because I don't know about mm -hmm. the rest of the world. We can't yeah. say, but yeah, there aren't that many permanent contracts. A lot, It's still a lot of a 
sort of freelance workforce, right? Yeah, and like shortest, I mean, I had contracts that were six months and I had contracts that were two years long, but it's usually everybody's going from contract to contract. So you already start uh, a contract thinking, I need to start applying for the next one. Um, and, and so you, every, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's a beautiful profession and it's so noble, you know, in so many ways, museums are s- such a wonderful institutions. But the truth is, in this environment, in this country, in the UK, as I said, as you say, you know, I've only had worked here, so I don't know how it goes in other places. But in the UK, it's mostly short term contracts. So you're always having to think about the next one. And because it's so competitive, so competitive, um, it's, it, it gets hard. And so, you know, you're working with somebody and you become very close friends. Um, but then in, in two months from now, you're both going to be fighting for the same position. And this is when it can get a little bit, um, you know, sticky. Yeah. So, yeah, but you had, you know, an amazing experience. I mean, you've worked everywhere, but also you've done a lot of different things. And then you, the past, I don't know, few years you got really interested perhaps or more interested in not western his fashion history yes and you also started teaching more right so yes. i think it would be nice to hear about you know how those interests developed and how you you know how do you make the transition kind of back to university yeah well the Funny. So when I was doing my master's, as I said, I had the scholarship with historic royal palaces and I was working there, but University College London, so the place you see where I did my master's, you had to have so many hours of uh, placement experience in order to graduate and get a diploma. At the end, you needed to do, I think, like the equivalent of two months of experience. Um, And it couldn't be my experience at historic royal palaces. They said, no, you have to go somewhere else. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. That's crazy. I was like, and and I always wanted to be with fashion, you know, dress. Not necessarily fashion, but with dress collections, textile collections. Um, And they were like, yeah, try to go somewhere that you haven't worked before. And I was like, okay, that's getting a little bit trickier now. I have done the Museum of London, the V&A, and Historic Royal Palaces. Who else in bloody London has dress collections? Um, and then I was tell- talking to Beatrice, as I said, Beatrice, my career's godmother. And she was <laughs> like, oh, you know what? I just um, was talking to a curator at the British Museum. Her name is Judy Rudo. Um, and she looks after a very interesting collection. I think you should just contact her. Maybe it could be a place to go. I was like, well, great. I don't have the British Museum in my CV yet. Um, why not? So I sent Judy, so Beatrice gave me Judy's email and I sent Judy this very like, hi, my name is Isabella. I'm current a student at, you know, I'm doing museum studies at UCL and I need to do a placement. And Beatrice always did name drop. Name drop is the number one rule to get anywhere um, in this industry. So I was like, oh, Beatrice suggested I contacted you. Um, just wondering if you have any opportunities. And Judy replied to me in, I think, five minutes. She was like, oh, my God, this is like, you know, universe sending you me. I actually have this huge project and I'm desperately in need of help. And, and she was like, do you want to just come for a chat? I'll tell you what the project is. So I, I went there, you know, um, that was November. I remember it was a horrible British day. It was raining, it was cold, it was gray. And I was like, no, it's fine. It's the sign of beautiful things to come. Um, and I, I, just, <laughs> I just went to the British Museum and I met Judy and it was love at first sight. I, now Judy is, you know, again, a mentor and a wonderful, wonderful person. And she looks after me and, you know, takes me for dinner and, <laughs> and things like that. She is wonderful. But basically the project that she was working was she had been given. So Judy is a senior curator uh, in the, at the British Museum. She's the longest serving member of staff from the British Museum. She has been there for over 45 years. I think it's 40, 
47 years that she's been working at the BN. She has been there since the 70s. Um, and Judy is like the mo one of the most knowledgeable um, people I've ever met. She's a, her specialism is in jewelry, which is quite nice. Um, but she looks after the modern European collection. So the British Museum, the departments are not divided by types of objects. So the v &A, you have the fashion department, you have the ceramics department, you have the sculpture department. Um, but at the British Museum, it's divided by area of the world. So you have the European department, you have the Asian department, you have the America's department. Um, and Judy is a senior curator at the European department. So the collection that she looks after is all European objects. Um, and it's her collection is modern. So it's from the 18th century, well, late 17th century to present day. And she looks after everything. So it's um, all the ceramics, glass design, um, what else? Textiles, ethnic dress. But this, this particular project, so she had been given uh, about 600 objects of Scandinavian design from the 20th century. So it was mostly like ceramics and glass and a little bit of jewelry as well. And she needed somebody to help process all that. So I, I work in that. It was great because I was exposed to objects that I haven't come across before. Um, and then we finished that. And by that point, I was, you know, she was my second mother. I didn't want to leave her. I didn't want to leave the BM. I absolutely love the British Museum. And she was like, okay, so we finished with that. What would you like to do? You're interested in textiles. Do you want to um, help me photograph some of our ethnic dress collection? And I was like, sure. I mean, that sounds fun, you know. Um, <laughs> by that point, I was saying yes to anything. I mean, if Judy said, do you want to come count rocks? I would be like, yeah, that sounds brilliant. Um, any, anything to do with her, I was saying yes. But she was like, well, why don't we re-photograph some objects, uh, some ethnic dress? And I mean, first day, it was like, holy moly, you know, this is what I was born to do. I fell in love with ethnic dress like, like that. It was, it was brilliant. I mean, it was like my eyes had been open for the first time. I, those objects were so fucking brilliant and beautiful and strange and wonderful and you know about people that i had never heard about or people that i had heard about um and and i just fell in love with it and then i ended up writing my dissertation for my masters on two of those ethnic dress objects um that we were photographing so it was a hungarian um costume and and then a, a german coat um, and I just absolutely love it. it. It almost, it made sense. My life made sense. All of a sudden I was like, I'm complete. You know, this is what I love. I love identity. I love thinking about people and how people relate with their clothes and how their clothes communicate who they are, either as an individual or a member of a community. Um, and it all makes sense. So I now went from being a fashion historian to being a dress historian. So I'm very, very, very interested in kind of that side. It also coincides with a period where we are now thinking about anything that is other than, you know, the stereotypical kind of white, Western, you know, kind of people and their stories. And now we, we're realizing there are a hundred other stories that are just as worth of saying and it should be told and it should be talked about um so it just coincided of my eyes being opened to a moment in time so this is when i started teaching at central st martin's because i kept in contact with all my the tutors so kelly blackman and you know alistair o'neill all the people that had taught me they always i always kept in touch so when i was at um Star Wars Palaces, I kept talking about what I was doing and we would go for coffee sometime. And then when I was at the British Museum, I kept telling them. Um, and then when I 
said, oh, I'm really interested in ethnic dress now at the British Museum, was the same time that my tutor, Kelly Blackman, she was starting a new module called, well, she was thinking about starting a new module for the fashion history students called Global Perspective. So it was looking at non-Western fashion and it just was perfect. So I partnered with her and we're in our, we just did our third year of Global Perspective and we work very hard together um, and we love it. And, you know, it's always growing and now Global Perspective is growing not just for the fashion history students, but also for all the fashion design students. And that's something that I'm going to be leading on. So it, it just, came organically because one day Judy said, do you want to photograph some some clothes? That's crazy. And I remember at the time I hated those clothes so much because basically you were working for, you know, the historic royal palaces, you were doing your master's and any spare time you had, you were at the British Museum. So you like virtually disappeared from our lives. I did. And every time we asked you where you were, you would send us photos of some jackets you know <laughs> and we would be like well I don't know what that means because I don't think I know anyone who loves like clothes in that way as much as you do you it's know? so true I know I, I did disappear that's the thing like when you're starting you just work flat out and I I'm very I was very bad at work life balance I mean trying to get better now but it was horrible. Like we went without seeing each other for what two years? Yeah, like a year. But yeah, it was crazy. I yeah, mean, you are very bad at that. You love clothes way more than you love people. That's for sure. <laughs> but I love you. Yes. No, I love you too. But it's okay. I didn't take it personally. I know what it's like. <laughs> London is hard. You have to work like a crazy person to get your, especially when you're, you know, not from the country or not from the mm -hmm. area. Yeah, you know the the places are so competitive, and there's you know there's not a lot you can do. You have to make your mark somehow. I think exactly, and I mean when the opportunity is there, you have to embrace it because it won't be there anymore, or somebody else will take it. You know, so if you want to progress, sometimes you have to make make sacrifices for not forever. You know, but if that period all of a sudden a lot of doors are opening for you to be exploring this particular work or, you know, focusing more on your career. You do that because at one point that will pay off and you will grow. And then one day you can have your balance back. Yeah, that's true. Well, one day we hope is, I don't know if you'll ever be very balanced, but okay. Uh, we'll we'll pretend, I mean, it's not we'll right now. That that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, but, Okay, so I want to know then what is the what is a really good advice you'd give to someone who works in the industry that you're in or who wants to work in the industry? Um, okay, um, I, oh, oh God, um, I need the advice myself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. It's true. It's true. I do need the advice. But I do have that. I think my advice is find people that can help you and can advise you. So, you know, I had Beatrice, I had Deirdre, I had, I have Judy, I have Kelly, you know, just surround yourself with, with people that know you and, and, you know, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Like when my contracts would end, I would call everybody and say, my, my contract is ending, help, you know, do you know of anything? Because most of the time people do want you to succeed and they will, if they hear something, they will, they will come your way. And, you know, so many of the opportunities I got were because somebody mentioned them to me. So I think don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Um, nobody's perfect. And, you know, we're all struggling from time to time and you need the help. So if you can surround yourself with people that, believe in you and in order to do that you have to prove that you're worth being believed you know like you you have to do the hard work but surround yourself and don't be afraid to be vulnerable and, and keep in contact with them not because one day you're gonna need them but you know maybe one day they will need you too and it's nice to be to be there um so i think my number one um advice would be don't be afraid to be vulnerable be in contact, you know, ask for help if you need help. Um, 
be open to opportunities. If something comes your way and you feel like, oh, I'm already doing this, well, find a way to do both or, you know, just for a little bit. Um, and then also be nice to people. I mean, it's, <laughs> seriously, yeah. it's such a competitive, difficult industry. It's wonderful. You know, every day feels like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Christian, so I would say every day feels like Christmas, but um, every day feels like a special day working in a museum because the job is really lovely, but it's very badly paid. Um, and, you know, it's it's mostly temporary contract. It's very competitive. It's a hard life. So be nice. <laughs> Don't make it more <laughs> difficult than it yeah. has to be. I think be nice is a good advice to everybody. But I really like what you said about relationships being a two-way street. You know, sometimes people will need you and then it's really good when you can be there for them in a really sincere way, I think. Yeah. As you said, we all like to help, usually. Yeah, um, I mean, if you can. You know, and like most people that I have met, they try, they, they do try to help you. I mean, some people tend to think about themselves first. So if as long as you're not treading their way, but that's a different story altogether. But, you know, everybody at one point or another, they do want to help you, you know, helping somebody makes you feel good. So, so be nice. Yes, that's <laughs> nice. very good. So Isa, before we wrap it up, mm -hmm. that was right, right? Wrap it up, kick yeah. it off, wrap it up. I'm really bad with that. But anyway, before we wrap it up, since <laughs> you're such a museum lover, Uh -huh. If someone comes to London, what uh -huh. are the top three museums and collections, whatever, that they need to see? Okay, Considering so, that we don't live in a pandemic. Okay, so when we're not in a pandemic and life and you know, museums are open and you don't have to book things in advance and blah, 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 blah. Um, I would say, it. I mean, also it depends on what your interest because there there is a museum for every thing in london like there's a museum for you know childhood yes there is there is a museum for like medical stuff yes there is i mean there's a museum for everything so it depends a little bit of what you want um british museum duh every single um you know tourist guide will tell you go to the british museum but Do that, absolutely. But try to go not to just to see the Rosetta Stone and a couple of mummies, you know, go see the other things they have. They have some absolutely amazing objects and think critically about them. You know, some objects are very strange. What does that mean to you? How do you interpret them? I think the British Museum is a great place to think about the world, think about other people. Also maybe question, why is this object here or why is it not somewhere else? Think critically. I think the British Museum is a great place to for us to reevaluate us as humanity. Um, but then, I mean, you're gonna get the British Museum everywhere. So I would say, definitely the Welcome Collection. So the Welcome um, is mostly focused on medicine and medical history, but they make they always blend their exhibitions with art. So it's always talking about something to do with wellness and health and medicine but through an artistic creative perspective and because they're independent they're not afraid to go into controversy and difficult subjects and their exhibitions are the best i mean i haven't seen one that i didn't like they're really 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 good so the welcome number one um i would say also um Leighton house it's not a museum it's a historic house and is in um kensington area no there is more considered holland park oh, holland maybe? park yeah yeah um and is a this historic house it used to belong to this artist called layton um hence layton house um and it, it he was um an artist at the end of the 19th century and he was very interest in um kind of other cultures particularly islamic culture so the house um it's it's absolutely fabulous it, you know there's one um room where he designed to be kind of a, a miniature of a mosque 
and there's a lot of like Islamic um, tiles and Islamic art, and it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful house. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and number three, I would say. Um, oh my God! Yes, the Wallace collection. Of course, the Wallace collection. That's like my safe place. If if I feel miserable or I need a little cry, I usually go to the Wallace. <laughs> And I have a particular room that I always go to have my, you know, if something is not going right and I need beauty around me and I need to be in a safe space, uh, places, the Wallace is where I go. So there's a particular room. If you ever come to that room and you see me there, just pass by. I'm probably having a little crisis, you know, um, but it's a wonderful collection. It used to be a, a private collection. Um, and now it's open to the public and the house is beautiful and they have this wonderful courtyard with the best cakes in London. So beautiful art, wonderful cakes. And some furniture from Marie Antoinette, no? Yes. So yeah. the house is mostly 18, the furnishing of the house is mostly 18th century. So all the schemes, the rooms, they are all 18th century, uh, beautiful, you know, Rococo. Um, schemes oh so gorgeous but then the art collection is amazing um, the best Rococo art collection in the UK um, and then they also have really good 17th century um, Dutch um, paintings and a fabulous armory collection so yeah, all that around is, that is the best part because there's a horse that looks like a unicorn <laughs> yes That is absolutely true. Go yeah. see the horse that looks like a unicorn. Yes. This is where we first met. Do you remember? Yes, I do remember. And you took me to that room to see yeah. the swinging person. Swinging. Yes, the swing. The swing. The swing. Yeah, I'm very good at memorizing names of artworks, as you can tell. Uh, yes, it was really nice. It, that courtyard is amazing. Oh, it's it's so great nice. to impress parents who come to London. Oh, absolutely. Family, it's friends. Nice. It's so civilized and yet it's never like super busy because obviously the British Museum or the V&A, they can get packed. Yeah. This and is the Wallace, not... Yeah, it's free entry, right? So Yes. they. Um, I think only the Leighton House, from those that I suggested, I think only Leighton House is paid because it's independent. Uh, but Wallace and the Welcome, um, they're both free. So really worth going. Yeah. Isa, thank you so much for being the first guest ever on our podcast. Oh, yay. Thank you. It's, it, it, no, it has been so fabulous and exciting. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And I'm going to leave your website on the show notes. I've always wanted to say show notes. Uh, so everyone can follow you and find out more about what you do. Thank you. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Isa. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the I Like Networking podcast. Please remember to share, subscribe, and review the podcast so that more people can find us. All the information discussed on this episode will be on the show notes. See you next time.